Ruth was a Moabite. She was a Moabite woman. She was not part of the people of God. This is one of those cases in Scripture where you see that a Jewish family had relocated in Moab because of a famine, and this Jewish family has, has allowed or, or had the experience of a Jewish young man marrying a Moabite young woman, marrying someone from outside their own people. In Esther, what we have is, is a clearly delineated lineage. We have, a, we have a man. We have his heritage given to us. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. The, the emphasis being this was a sound Jewish family. This was a solid Jewish family whose lineage was known. And Esther has been in that line all her life. She's been in that line all her life. So one way to look at this is this. Here's Ruth who marries into the people of God as an adult. And then there's Esther who was brought up in it. Right? Just out of curiosity, how many of you were brought up in church? Okay, you would be kind of Esther's. How many of you got saved later in life? Okay, you would be Ruth's. Okay, you would be people that came in later on, became part later on. So Ruth 1.16 records the most famous words that Ruth ever spoke. When she said, your people will be my people and your God will be my God, Ruth got saved. Amen? I was a Moabite. I'm leaving that life behind me. Now, sadly, sadly, uh, Naomi's other daughter-in-law, Orpah, she doesn't go that route. She has the opportunity. She doesn't, right? But Ruth says, I will leave my Moabite past. I will leave that past behind me. And your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Now listen, I think that's a very significant statement. Because you know what John says, 1 John tells us? That if, if you have been born again, one of the main evidences of, of having been born again is that you love the people of God. You love, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Now those two things seem to go together. Right? Those two things seem to go together. My, my uh, children and I have been joking around a little bit the last couple of days because uh, something that would not be important to most of you at all was very important to us. And that is that Barcelona's soccer team was playing um, one of Madrid's soccer teams. Now, we hate both of them <laughs> because it's not the right Madrid team. There's another Madrid team that's the, that's the godly team that we root for, right? But, but the three of them are competing for a league title. And, and, and for Real Madrid to win the league title, we needed either a tie or we needed Barcelona to win. And it was like, man, it was like, I was just like, for the first time in my life, how is it possible that I'm rooting for Barcelona? It's like everything, everything inside of me was rebelling against this notion of, I, I, I'm a traitor. There's something, right? Because we make too big of a deal of these things, right? But, but the point is this, that, that, that when you become a believer, all of a sudden, you've got a brand new set of allegiances, you got a new set of allegiances. You step into the family of God and it's, hey, wait a second. Those are my people. Those are my people. I'm not ashamed of them. I affiliate with them. Yeah, I belong to them, right? Those are my people and their God is my God. And so we have this beautiful picture of what happens when a person is born again. So in one sense, you could say that Ruth is the picture of a new convert, while Esther, you could say she was the one raised in church, but let's just say it this way. She's the one who is giving us an example of what it is to be kind of fully mature. She's been in this for a long time, right? She's been in this for a long time. She's grown up in the faith. She's ready to serve God in a crucial, dangerous ministry. God's got something for her to do now. And he's been preparing her for a long time for it. And it's perilous. 
It's treacherous. It's dangerous. She's going to be in enemy territory. But God has called her for this, and he's prepared her for this. This may be one reason why God is so obviously present in Ruth and so conspicuously absent in Esther. How many of you know that along the way, God has to wean us from certain things in order to teach us what it means to live by faith and not by sight? I don't know if this resonates with you, but one of the things I've noticed is this, that when the gospel first steps into a country, part of what happens is an absolute outburst of the miraculous of the supernatural. Why? Because one of the things we see in the New Testament is that God confirms the preaching of the gospel with signs and wonders. Right? And, and this is often the case for new believers as well. They come into the faith, and it's like they see God, God just seems to like move things for them, and, and, and just they're like, oh, wow, this is just un unbelievable, the things that God does, right? And so present. And as you grow... It's not that God ceases doing those things entirely or that he becomes more absent, but he begins to, to teach us the importance of having some sea legs underneath us, right? And, and, and he's going to put us in some trying places and ask us to stand on our own two feet. And so you've got a book in which God is just doing everything in, in Ruth's life, and then you've got Esther where it's like, you're grown up, now you stand, you stand, right? And there seems to be a certain lesson there that, that Esther is going to have to live out her faith in the absence of seeing God act in some way. I mean, listen, God, you, if you know the story of Esther, God could have, like, in some miraculous way just delivered his people and Haman would have fallen over dead all by himself. But God says, no, for all appearances to human eyes, I'm going to do nothing. And Esther, you're going to do it, right? It's the mature believer who has stepped into a place of ministry and has to walk by faith, not by sight, has to live it out. I just suggest it as a, as a possible way of looking at these books. But let's do this this morning before we close. Let's, let's take a look at the book of Esther and let's consider three key moments in the book of Esther. Three key events in the book of Esther. And, and probably the last time I'll say it, men, apply this to yourself, but ladies, I'm talking specifically to you this morning. We're looking at Esther. This is Mother's Day. Ladies, consider these three moments in the life of Esther. The first, the first instance that I want to look at is from Esther chapter 2. And in this moment, it teaches us something about the power of trust. About the power of trust. Esther 2, look with me in verse 12. I'm skipping into the story a little bit. Let me give you just a little bit of the backstory. King Ahasuerus' wife, Vashti, has, has uh, refused to do something that he wanted her to do. And so he decides she's not deserving to be the queen anymore. And so someone comes up with a brilliant idea to have what, it, what amounts to a beauty pageant. And whichever young woman you like the best will become your new queen. And so they're beginning this process of bringing one young woman after another to the king for him to decide which one he's going to pick for his next queen. So in verse 12, it says, Now when the turn of each young lady came to go in to King Ahasuerus, after the end of her 12 months, under the regulations for, their women, for the women, for the days of their beautification were completed as follows, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and the cosmetics for women. The young lady would go in to the king in this way. Anything that she desired was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go in, and in the morning she would return to the second harem, to the custody of Sheashgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not again go in to the king unless the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. 
Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, came to go into the king, she did not request anything except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, advised. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. Let me just start by, by asking this question. Do you think Esther really wanted to be King Ahasuerus' wife? You know anything about him? King Ahasuerus? Listen, I've already mentioned the first thing. So when you think about whether Esther wants to be this man's wife, here's what he had done with his first wife. He's throwing a big party, and he decides that he wants everyone to see how beautiful his wife is, and all he wants to do is parade her as a sort of beauty object in front of everybody's eyes to behold. And she's like, you know what? I don't feel like being put on parade like that. Just for the ogling of everyone's pleasure. I'm not going to do that. And he says, oh no? And it becomes a major kingdom crisis. What are we going to do? If the queen can get away with that, everybody's wives are going to become rebellious. Out with Vashti. That who you want to be married to? You don't do what I tell you to do. It's out with you. Right? That the kind of marriage that you think anyone really wants to have? How many of you girls, young ladies, just aspire to grow up someday and think to yourself, you know, someday I want to be part of a beauty pageant in which one young man gets the pick out of everybody he wants and the rest of us are just there to see if we can get his attention. What a degrading, what a degrading outlook on life. I mean, who wants to be married to the guy who sits there and says, yeah, you're all just here to be a beauty pageant for me. For my pleasure. Whichever one I pick, that's what I'll have. What kind of a, what kind of a man do you think you're going to get if that's the guy you have to marry? If you, uh, if you Google King Ahasuerus, you'll discover that um, King Ahasuerus is known by another name. His, name is, his other name was Xerxes I. He's called different names, different, different peoples. But he was a, a very well-known king. And if you want to know the things he was well known for, he was well known for being a heavy drinker. He was a drinker. He was well known for his temper. He was a man with a violent temper. And he was known for his immorality. He was a womanizer. An angry, heavy drinking womanizer. That's who Esther was potentially going to marry. What a, what a wedding day to look forward to. In fact, one source I read said this. He was an arrogant, controlling, self-important, manipulative, insecure, proud, misogynistic man. <laughs> How do you like that for your tombstone <laughs> when you die? I want them to put on my tombstone that, uh, that I was a, um, an arrogant, controlling, self-important, manipulative, insecure, proud, misogynistic man. Right? Wow, what a way to go down in history. That's who he was. Now, I'm saying all that to say this, and I'm going to move on to the next point because, because I'm going to touch on this again in a minute. Please hear this. In the face of all that, Esther never seems to flinch. She never seems to flinch. That is a stunning thing. It's like she looks at this and says, oh, first of all, just think about this. She looks at, at the king's eunuch, Haggai, and says, whatever you recommend is what I'll take in. You tell me, that's what I'll do. She never, she never once complains. She never once 
shows anything but. If this is what God has for me, then this is what will be. And I'm going to trust him through this. Right? This was a woman of deep faith. This is a woman of deep trust. She was a woman of deep trust in God's providence. She trusted that it was God who was going to direct her life. And she rested in that fact. I'll come back to that in a moment. The power of trust. Did Esther want to be Ahasuerus' wife? He was not a good man. Sorry, I should have done this. Esther never flinches. She puts her trust in God. The second thing that we see is the power of position. Esther 4, verses 9 through 17. Let me read the verses to you. Esther 4, verses 9 through 17. And Hathach came back and related Mordecai's words to Esther. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and ordered him to reply to Mordecai, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king, uh, to the king, to the inner court, who is not summoned, he has but one law, that he be put to death, unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. And I have not been summoned to come to the king for these thirty days." And they related Esther's words to Mordecai. Then Mordecai told them uh, to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you and the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens will fast in the same way, and thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and did just as Esther had commanded him. Now, you know the story. There's a plot against the Jews. There's a plot against... Happy Mother's Day. There's a... There's a plot against the Jews, right? And Mordecai, uh, Esther's uncle, appeals to Esther to step in and do something about this. He appeals to her to step in and do something about this. And she says, I've not been called to go see the king in 30 days. And here's the way the law of this land works. Anyone who walks into the king's presence uninvited is instantly killed. Now, if they're willing to take that risk, there's only one hope for them. The only hope is that the king will see them come in, say, I didn't invite you, eh, but I'm in a good mood today. Or, eh, I like you today. And I'll hold out the golden scepter, and then you can come in, and it all works out all right in the end. But if he does not hold out that golden scepter, he doesn't have to say a word. Someone's going to kill you on the spot. You're dead. And Mordecai answers her, well, listen, you don't know, but that you may have been put in that position. Notice it was the time that he could have mentioned God, but didn't. You could have been put into that position just for such a moment like this. And I want you to know that it's entirely possible that you in that position, thinking you're safe as the king's wife, are in more grave danger than anyone else. Because if you don't stand up and protect God's people, he, he doesn't say he, they will be delivered in some other way. But it might just be that you and your father's household all perish. Because the unspoken, there will be a God who will not be pleased with your inactivity. There will be a God who will not be pleased. Now, the first thing we see is her position as royalty. We have noted how often God puts, in fact, in our men's breakfast a couple weeks ago, we were talking about this, how often God puts one of his people in the number two position of authority to influence the guy that's in the number one position. And immediately what comes to mind are people like, who? Joseph, Joseph or Daniel, right? These are the people that come to mind. They get put in a position to influence the main guy, right? Now, notice this. Esther has no position in the government, but she happens to be the king's wife. And that makes her de facto the number two person in the kingdom. <laughs> 
She doesn't have to have a position. She's the king's wife. Right? One of the things I do with, 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 uh, married co- with, with couples that are about to be married is I ask them, if the Bible describes the man as the head, what body part is the wife? Go ahead. What's the number one answer I get? The neck. The neck. She's the one who turns the head. <laughs> okay? It's not the right answer. But, <laughs> but it's amazing that she does have that power. It's amazing that she does have that power, right? In essence, she's the number two person in the kingdom because she's married to King Ahasuerus. That's what God does here. He takes one of his people and puts her in the position of influence, in the number two position. And so we see that while, listen to this, while God has, and I want to harp on this just for one minute, while God has established gender roles and structures of authority, including for the family, please hear this, those roles and those structures are never without checks and balances, and they are never without consideration to the callings and the giftings that God has given to the individuals. What do I mean when I say that? Please hear this. I mean this. Not every husband-wife relationship looks exactly like every other one. Not all, they don't all look the same. Listen to this. Sometimes God has given to certain women some pretty extraordinary gifts and some pretty extraordinary callings. And if you're on the outside looking in, you might be tempted to say, man, is she out of order. And only that husband knows in their home how actually in order they are. But God uses her gifts and callings in a way that is very visible to everybody else. And please hear this. There is nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. The giftings and the callings that God gives to people. Listen, he puts Daniel in a position. He puts Joseph in a position. He's the same God who allowed Deborah to be in a position or who allowed Esther to be in a certain position in their own variety, in their own way, in their own form. Now, the point of this message is not to do a really big exposition of what roles are appropriate and to sort through all of that. My point this morning is to simply say this. Let us not forget that there is a tendency that we have as human beings. I said this last week. I know I'm repeating it this week. There is a tendency we have as human beings to take certain truths and then take them to places where God didn't intend for them to go. And when they do, they become, they become oppressive. They become something that God did not intend. I'm just going to pause here for one more second. One of the things that I have been grieved over, one of the things that I have been grieved for over, it, is, it has been an unintended consequence. I'm just, at, I'm just begging your indulgence for a moment. But several years ago, I had a very painful opportunity to, to talk to some, some young ladies who so graciously essentially said to me something like this. You know, in my home and in our church, we have so emphasized male and female and, and roles, husbands and wives, that I know nobody intended this, and I know it was never said this way, but I have to admit that as a young woman, I have really struggled with growing up, becoming an adult, and thinking that I had any value if it wasn't as a wife. And I have also struggled with feeling that I had equal value to a man in the sight of God. Now listen to this. The easy response to that is, no one ever said that to you. That's the easy response. No one ever said that to you. The hard response is to say, is it possible that we emphasize something so much that there was an unintended message that got communicated? That in a 
forming mind, a growing, not completely, that it, that it has an impact in a way that we don't realize. What am I saying this morning? One of the things I'm saying is that men, we have to go out of our way to affirm to the, to the daughters in our homes their competence, their value, their independent standing before God, their giftings, their callings. There may be differences in the way those are expressed, men and women, most of the time. But we have got to go out of our way to make sure that the women in, in our homes that have, that have been given to us by God under our care are nurtured and encouraged and, and, and discipled in a way that they are secure in their own standing before God. And listen, one of the things that means is that we cannot tolerate for one moment jesting in our home that speaks to a female as if she was inferior. When boys start teasing their sisters like that, they need to know there's a dad in the house. They need to know there's a dad in the house. And you're not going to speak that way to my daughter. Uh-uh. You know why? Because to let, that, to let that flourish is, number one, to do damage to your daughter, and number two, to, by your silence, let your son believe something about masculinity that God never intended. It's causing a problem on both sides. We have to know, we have to know, we have to understand that while God has established certain roles and structures of authority, and they are legitimate, and this world is throwing them out, we in the church must be careful to make sure that we put them in their place in the, in the whole of Scripture. And the book of Esther is one great example of a woman that God used in a tremendously important position at a very specific time, and her uncle was depending on her. And when she told him what to do, he went and did it. It's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting. Her position is royalty. It was a second-in-command position. And I've already addressed gender roles and structures. The second thing that we see in this is her place in time. Her place in time. We're talking about the power of position. She was in a, a specific position because there was a specific need at a specific time. In verse 14, he says to her, Mordecai says to her, who knows whether you have not obtained royalty for such a time as this. All right, let me take one moment on this. For such a time as this. Listen to this. How many of you have quoted that line various times in your life? Such a time as this. Quoted it? Thought about it? It was spoken to a woman. <laughs> this thing that we all quote so much, that we all use so much, it was spoken to a woman. You're here for such a time as this. You know, I, I think sometimes, sometimes in an overly strict view of men being the movers and shakers in the world, we have appropriated a phrase that interestingly was spoken to a woman. You're here for such a time as this. So let me just, let me just give a, an encouragement to the ladies. Ladies, Esther was a woman who lived in a place and time that was not an easy one. In fact, it was downright dangerous. She was the wife of a dangerous man. She was part of a people group that were living in captivity and had a death sentence over their heads. She didn't have exactly a comfortable uh, a comfortable circumstance to be living in. But I want you to hear the words that are spoken in 1 Peter. One verse. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. Peter is writing to, to women. The first six verses are writing to women. In verse 6, he says this. Thus Sarah obeyed Abraham. Boy, did Abraham give her some bad, ask her to do some bad things. Right? Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children. If you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. 
without being frightened by any fear. Can I ask, ladies, seeing everything that's going on in the world, how many of you have had moments of fear rise in your heart for your children? You had any of that? You know, we're living in crazy days. What's going on with this coronavirus is, in, is a, remarkable, it's a remarkable experiment. It's a remarkable social experiment. Watching children learn that they need a barrier over their faces to relate to anybody, who knows what kind of an effect that's going to have? Who knows? This has never been done before in this way, right? This is a remarkable day. We're living in a day when, when, when gender confusion has gotten so messed up that if you, if you ask Google to tell you how many genders there are, you won't be able to get the same answer from, from every place you look. The obvious thing that there's two is lost on everybody. You say to yourself, how does anybody make it in a day that's this mixed up? We've got, we've got real or imagined, we've got a, a whirlwind of racial tension that is just being whipped and whipped and whipped into a bigger frenzy all the time. For all the desire and all the spoken intent that there should be no racism, it seems that people are bound and determined to just keep stirring it up, stirring it up, stirring it up. Amen. It's a crazy day. There is, listen to this, there is a radical homosexual agenda that has already been almost completely successful. The statistics tell us that in our lifetimes, the percentages of Americans who view homosexual marriage favorably has gone from significant disapproval to significant approval. And you brought kids into this world. Way to go, Mom. Please hear this. You are here for such a time as this. And it is going to be increasingly necessary for you to heed the call to not be frightened by any fear. Please hear this. There is an absolute in Scripture, and that is that when, that when God demands that you live through a challenge, He promises to provide you the grace for that challenge. We have to trust that there is a God in heaven who knew about our time, allowed us to be here now, and is going to sustain us in it. He's going to give us wisdom for it. He's going to give us courage for it. He's going to give, listen, your kids do not have to grow up gender confused. Your kids do not have to grow up attracted to the same. Your children can grow up in the power of the Holy Spirit oriented correctly because there's a God in heaven who graces you for this day. You live with faith. You live with faith. There is no fear that should seize your heart. Do not forget there's a God in heaven. Do not forget that you are here by his divine appointment. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. Ladies, do not fear your day. You are the right people for this time. You are the right people for this time. Trust his wisdom and trust his empowering over your life. You're the right people for such a time as this. All right. The third thing that, that I'll close with very quickly is that in this book, what we see is the power of influence. And this is where we're going to close just a little bit differently. Esther 7 now the king and Haman came to drink wine with Esther the queen. And the king said to Esther on the second day, also as they drank their wine at the banquet, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to half the kingdom it shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said, 
If I found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me as my, as my petition, and my people as my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Now if we had only been sold as slaves, men and women, I would have remained silent. For the trouble would not be commensurate with the annoyance to the king. Then King Ahasuerus asked Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he who would presume to do thus? And Esther said, A foe and an enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman became terrified before the king and queen. Now, that is, a, that is an interesting scripture to consider. Ladies, listen to this. Your influence over men is greater than you think. And it can be used for evil or it can be used for good. But please hear this. If we would just brutally... Be honest for a moment. If we would all just be brutally honest for a moment, every man in this room will tell you that you women are powerful creatures. You are powerful creations. There is something about you that has a man's attention. You need to know how much influence God has given you. You need to know how much power you have, how much influence you have. The flip side of that is this. Men, recognizing that, you need to remember that your wife is a gift to you from God whose influence he determined to use in your life. She's not there just to be subservient to you. God designed her in a way that, that you should respond to her, her influence. Let me just stop for a second here, and let's just be honest. There are, listen, I'm only going to pick one thing. There are a lot of ways we could illustrate this and a lot of details we could go into. Some of us are more inclined one way. Some of us are more inclined another. But how many of you as, as men would say that your wife's approval means an awful lot to you. That, that, that how you feel about yourself, if it was just up to you, would only go so far that it's really helpful to have a woman behind you telling you, you know what, you're a good man. Right? We need that influence in our lives. Men, the point is this. Women are gifts whose influence should be encouraged, not just allowed. Just, oh yeah, you have some influence. Yeah, I'll allow you to... Forget allowed. No, I need your influence. I want your influence. Maybe one of the reasons that I'm, that I'm speaking this way so strongly is not only what I've seen... Listen, I'm going back to what I said earlier, but one of the things I've seen have been Christian young women who on social media, rightly or wrongly, because of their experience growing up in the church, have become kind of like miniature Christian feminists who just... And, and, and there's, there's an anger there, there's a frustration there, there's a pain there. Men, we need to see our wives, the women in our lives, as gifts that God has given to us, as people of influence whose influence needs to be encouraged, welcomed, not tolerated, not theoretically said, yeah, you have, no, encouraged, welcomed. Our women are a gift to God from us. It's Queen Esther that turns King Ahasuerus she influences him. We need them, and God intends to use them in our lives. The last thing I'll say is this. <laughs> Ladies, you have influence with God. Sometimes, if things get too extreme, too rigid, one of the conversations I've had with ladies has been, has been, and I, well, just, I'll just say it. 
is to, is to encourage people to remember that the priesthood of the believer is a real thing. It's not the priesthood of the male believer. The husband does not stand between his wife and God. She stands beneath God. She has her own walk with God. And please hear this. She has direct access to the throne of grace. And I might just suggest that, man, that ought to make a few of us quake a little bit. <laughs> because if she's praying in a way that will make you uncomfortable, God just might hear her. She has direct access to God. Her influences are powerful. Listen, we think of, we think of, um, of Esther as a picture of, the, uh, of the, the church. In John 16, Jesus said, You ask anything of the Father in my name, and it will be given. Up until now, you have not prayed in my name, but I'm telling you to pray in my name. And when you pray in my name, he will hear you, and it will be done. And what he's encouraging is that, that, that the church has powerful influence with God. And ladies, what we see here in the specifics of Esther is that she had powerful influence by her appeal. It teaches us something about the power of a woman's influence in prayer. Our prayers move the Father to action, and they do so by his design. I know that sounds maybe heretical to some, but please hear this. There are things God will not do that he is willing to do until he hears someone pray for it. It's a bold statement, but there's plenty of scripture to back it up. You have not because you ask not. There are some things that God does only in response to his people praying for it. We are called to pray, and prayer moves the Father's heart to action. So here's the odd way we're going to close today. So it's Mother's Day. Ordinarily, we let mothers, wives, mothers, females, be the recipients of the blessing of prayer. But today, I just want to say to you ladies, we need you to pray for us. On this Mother's Day, I'm going to ask you moms to go to work for a few minutes. Ladies, would you just take a moment right now and start praying for your husbands? Because you have power with God. I'm telling you, you have power with God. God hears the cries of a praying wife and a praying mother. And ladies, we need you. We need you to be praying for us. So ordinarily, we do this the other way. But here's what I'm going to ask for this morning. I'm going to ask you all to stand up. And if your family's here, wives and mothers, I'm going to ask you to lay hands on your husband. <laughs> and men, I'm going to ask you to receive their prayers today. So... This thing might be, I don't know. I don't know how customary this is. Go ahead and stand up. I don't know. You've been sitting a long time. I don't know how customary this is everywhere. But you know, the laying on of hands is a thing in Scripture. It's actually a thing in Scripture. It's challenging to figure out exactly what all is entailed there. Ladies, you only have two hands. You probably need to lay them both on your husband. <laughs> But maybe if your husband only needs one, you can lay one on a, on a child. But we're going to ask you to lay hands on us today and to pray for us. Would you do that this morning? And I'm going to pass this microphone to our sister, Noelle Carroll. And we're just going to give two minutes. You judge the time, Noelle, for everyone to pray. And then she's going to close us in prayer this morning. All right, ladies, we need you. Pray for us today. Oh, I'll come back there then. All right, I'm going to the back. <laughs> so my wife can lay two hands on me because I need it. So, all right. Ladies, please pray. And, and one last. Try just a little bit. I know this will be uncomfortable. No one's going to be listening to you. Can we hear just a little bit of the sounds of your voices, ladies? Like, could you just, even if it's quietly, could you pray out loud a little bit? 
You, some of you may say, this in my home, in my, I, I don't do that with my husband. I, you need to do that. Ladies, there's something about hearing someone pray for you that is powerful. In church, if we could hear female voices in this place praying for the men in this church who need it, it would be a blessing on this Mother's Day. We'll give back to you the rest of the day. The rest of the day, we'll do our best to give to you. Right now, we're asking you to pray for us. Would you do that? All right, take a few minutes to pray.